going to call a bit of an audible this morning. Um, I would like to, uh, once we enter into the, the time of our, our first our first morning song, I, I we selected um, the Tabernacle Choir. Um, they've sung a beautiful rendition of Morning Has Broken. And uh, once we hit that, I'd like to just keep the, keep the atmosphere um, contemplative and worshipful and um, <laughs> and so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and give like all the business and announcements up front since we're talking about, you know, kind of the life of the congregation. And this is um, also a very important part of why we gather here this morning to find out how our lives are going. Um, so by Bible class this Wednesday at, at 2 p.m., the following week, the week leading up to Easter, we will not be meeting uh, as a Bible class. I, of course, I'll send out the Zoom link in advance for this week's meeting, and I uh, would love to see you there. And then the second um, is a continuation of the big announcement that we made last week where we are returning to in-person worship, cautiously returning to in-person worship in, from two weeks from today. So next week we'll meet per usual through Zoom, send out the links and all of that. And then the following week we will have um, our cautious re-entry, which in our plan for re-entry was entitled Dipping Our Toes in the Water. And I emailed out the... Um, I re resent out the, those, those parameters and the different sort of safety protocols that we designated to be in place, really just following what the CDC guidelines recommend. And also in keeping with the email that went out last week from the re Indiana region, uh, basically outlining exactly what our plan is and um, <laughs> how, how we will gather will be clearly communicated um, in the week leading up to that um, especially, but um, also once you arrive, will be clear instructions so there won't be any confusion. But a lot of it, I suspect, you'll be fairly well familiar with um, as you know, other institutions have had these soft openings and safety protocols in place. If you've gone to any, any public space, you know, you've seen the signs and, and heard the advice and the guidance from the people at those places. And so I don't think very much of it will seem very, uh, very foreign. But for those who are unable to gather, um, two things. One, uh, we will continue to do the live stream on Facebook, but also we will be live streaming our service through a YouTube link that will get sent out in. Pardon, sorry, one second. Um, that will be getting sent out um, in in the in the week prior, and um, that way, for those who aren't able to gather, we'll be able to see what's going on in our sanctuary, and uh, the sound will be pulled in straight from the soundboard so it'll be good sound and um and uh that way you'll be able to join us in that way but also following the service we're going to have a zoom call fellowship hour uh, where we will meet exactly like this except it will be just to have an informal chat to find out how others are doing for those who are unable to um, share in the conversation um in the conversations that we have and so that is basically the gist and again you'll see another um explainer in this coming wednesday update and um more instruction in the following week um mr heed are we going yes. to have the um sunday school classes no no in the first stage of re-entry there's those are all right. if they happen are still but will remain digital um so if Lester you get her to know that too okay um well if, I'll give him a call to, to clarify to him, but it's also, I don't know, not everybody gets the emails I know. So if, if those of you who, who didn't get the, um, the Wednesday email, didn't see the, the guidelines, that's, that's specified that all other auxiliary activities will continue to meet um, remotely. We'll be oh, really focusing on that time of worship on Sunday morning at 1045. Okay, thanks. So um, that, those are the announcements that I have. I would like to now open it up to uh, the rest of you for um, joys or concerns or prayer requests or anything that you might like me to know. I've, I've muted everybody. So if you have something to say, please unmute yourself. Margaret Taylor is doing really well. <clears throat> she's, su she's surprised <clears throat> how good she's feeling, but her daughter's having a birthday today. So she's with her daughter and family celebrating that this morning. Well, on, on that vein, I have um, news from Sandra Anderson. I spoke with her on the phone this week and sure. um, she is leaving the room that she has been holed up in for over a year, a, a special care unit. And she's being put into a room that she is 
is um, um, more homey and, and comfortable for her. And she is excited for that move. And, and she said that she would let me know when she has all of the details for that. But uh, she's been wanting out of um, that room in the, in the special care unit for a long time. And so she is very excited to finally uh, be, be on her way. And this is also a sign of progress. And so that's a, that's a joy that she is, uh, she is feeling, feeling better in, in that respect. I'd like to mention that Jack has fallen a couple of times, including once this morning, but he's up walking around again. And um, it's just always a concern. Uh, I have a joy. It was nice to do yoga with Judith. Hmm. Sorry, I missed it, Janet. I appreciate your kind invitation. Maybe I'll make it one of these days. Yeah, you, you should try. It was it was really very nice. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> time time is a thing. <laughs> Stretching is the thing. I, 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 well, anyway, I won't get into oh, that. Oh, this was just breathing. I mean, there's, oh. yeah, Friday. Friday is breathing. Okay. Friday, mm -hmm. Friday is breathing, and then Monday we do light stretches, and we sit on a chair, and my teacher has two titanium hips. She's 83 years old. What an inspiration. And our oldest member is 101. Thank you for sharing. So what time is that on Fridays, Janet? Uh, it'll be 12 p.m. Indiana time. It'll be 9 a.m. for me, 12 p.m. It's just half hour, uh, 9 to 9, I mean 12 to 12.30. And the name of the teacher is Lily. I think I sent out links, so I'll send it out to you again. Yes, please. I will join you. Yeah, you can just lay on your bed. That's what I do. It sounds like Jay is trying to get a word in right here. Hi. No, nothing, nothing important. Well, I've had my first shot. Um, Great. Congratulations. I feel, yeah. I feel like that in the, in the group of regulars that I, I was the straggler. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's a Pfizer shot. So I will not have my second shot before we meet together in person uh, for Easter, but, um, but I will the following Sunday. So, so I don't know if that oh. makes us hundred percent as a congregation for, for, uh, um, and I don't know about your family, Heath. I guess I guess obviously the children haven't had a chance to get vaccinated. Yeah, no, no, as Kelly, but we're we're basing our return on the com the numbers in the community, right? Not on who in our specific in our congregation are vaccinated. Although I'm glad to hear it when it happens. I, I understand that, but I also, yeah. you know, we're so close to everyone having the vaccination in our regular group. That's just a joy for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's been one of the things that has made me feel better about our decision. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing. Well, if there are no other joys or concerns, I will pray in a moment. But first, let's still and quiet our spirits as we enter into a time of worship, um, of, of preparation for uh for the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning together and to tell us things about ourselves that we need to know so that we might become more like Jesus. And the first song that we will be enjoying together is Morning Has Broken, sung by the Tabernacle Choir.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the beginning of spring and for Easter being just around the corner and all that that signifies. A yearly reminder that on the other side of every tomb and kind of death, there is hope for restorative resurrection life. And it is my prayer that this year of all years that what we experience around this time of year and the hope that this time of year brings will be felt and held throughout the course of the year going forward and that we might live to be Easter people, not only around Easter time, but throughout the year, believing in a God that can call us from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from brokenness to healing in every season and in every desperate situation. We thank you for those places where we have seen evidence of this, for those among us who have experienced healing or their, their bodies, uh, feeling relief from pain and feeling a, a new lease on life and joy and every good thing. But we also pray for those among us who are still very much in the valley of the shadow, who feel um, a desperate need for healing and wholeness, whether in mind or body or spirit. We pray for Northwood Christian Church, our, our beloved community, especially in this season of uh, change and moving forward and returning back into what is so familiar, our sanctuary, but in a new way, a way that we have never experienced before. And I pray that what the most important thing is, your Holy Spirit uh, moving and being felt. Well, I pray that that, will, that that will happen, that we will feel your presence in the sanctuary um, as we hope to feel your presence in moments like even now, and that we will learn that the only sort of praise that you require is a human heart turned towards you and that you are always and ever with us. We thank you. We invite your spirit, your presence, your word into the space, convict us and change us. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello. Before we dive into today's scripture reading, I have a bit of an announcement. Actually, it's a lot of an announcement. We are excited to announce that on April 4th, Easter Sunday, our church, Northwood Christian Church, is returning to in-person worship. We will, of course, do so with great caution, utilizing best practices as prescribed by the Center for Disease Control and by now, I'm sure you know the drill. Social distancing, seats will be spaced out and clearly marked where people can sit. You'll be wearing masks if you attend. Everyone there will be wearing masks, sanitation practices, etc. And if you're interested in learning more about our safety protocols, please email us and we'll get back to you. I'll put the email on the screen right now, both to our office and to myself, and you can write us an email and we'll write back and let you know what we'll be doing to make sure that our return is safe. I also want you to know that if you've been enjoying these recordings on Facebook Live or on YouTube, never fear. They will continue. I'll continue to record my message for each week for those who are unable to attend our in-person service. And if you've been enjoying these videos, please consider visiting our website www.indyncc.org that's indyncc.org to learn more about our ministries and if you would like to support our ministries please consider donating by clicking on our Givelify link found in this video's description. Moving on. Today's scripture passage is found in the Gospel of John chapter 12 verses 20 through 33 and they read now among those who went up 
to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then... A voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The next time you plant a seed in the dirt, say to yourself, there, I have killed it. This, of course, would be a strange thing to say. We are so familiar with the concept of planting and harvesting in turn that we view the falling of a seed to the earth as a new beginning. For we know that in the coming weeks and months, the seed will sprout an inch towards the sun. Its rising can be seen as an exuberant celebration of life. What could be more alive then than a tender shoot pulling water from its roots while spreading leaves to catch the light. But let's throw off for just a second our modern understanding of horticulture and consider the mystery packed in this short parable that Jesus puts in this longer saying, that of a seed dying to find life. Uh, because by now, we've observed so many seeds breaking forth to new life that the whole process has become nearly mundane. But when you step back and consider things anew, the entire process is counterintuitive. In temperate climates, the plant spends the hot summer months spreading out and swelling to newer and fuller life. Leaves stretch out eagerly, basking in yellow rays. Branches and vines are laden with fruit, bright in color and rich in flavor. Then, just when things seem like they are really getting going and going well for the plant, the plant begins to fade. The frost comes. The fruit's bright color begins to wane. The leaves begin to wither. And the fruit begins to shrivel falls to the ground and is eventually swallowed by the earth. This is a kind of dying. All change in one form or another may be a kind of dying, but it is a kind of letting go as well. Imagine that you hold a seed in your hand. It is a seed you have long cherished for you have held it in your hand for a long time. And why? because you know that contained in that seed is something special. However, you are loath to let it go, for if you do, you feel as though you will lose it all or part of yourself. Does this sound far-fetched? Not so. I've seen it happen in recent years. 
only a few years ago, my daughter was playing in our backyard in the moments while I was getting ready to take her to preschool when she made a great discovery. As I approached her to get her ready to enter into the vehicle and leave for her preschool, she said, Dad, look! And on the ground, she had created a little pile of small black beads. At first, I was afraid that they were rabbit droppings, but on closer examination, I discovered that they were seeds. They were about the size of small blueberries and coal black. She had pulled them from the pod of a plant that lay shriveled on the ground. The plant had died, you see. It had no more life in it but the seeds. She knew that they were special, intuited it at four years old. And I knew this was so because when I asked for them, she drew her hand back wondering if I were going to throw them away. No, I said, for I didn't want to pick a fight with a four-year-old in the morning. However, I have a sneaking suspicion that she is going to do the same thing with those seeds as she does with her collection of buckeyes. I think she plans to hoard them, and if she does it, it will be very difficult for her to let them go. And she ought to know better. Really, she should, for in that year prior, we had planted a garden together. We had taken little seeds, seeds that looked every bit as dead as the ones that she was hoarding in that moment and the ones that she hoards in her room. And we let them fall to the earth. And I showed her how to cut a very small furrow with her finger in the raised bed garden and how to gently lay the small carrot seeds to rest. And in the following weeks, we marveled at how the little seeds came alive, creating new life. What's more, they have now left seeds of their own. So she has seen with her own eyes what may happen if she were to let seeds go. I recently heard a story about some archeologists who were digging about in Egypt and they found amongst pottery shards and artifacts, some wheat seeds. Now they, estimated that those wheat seeds had been cast aside approximately 5,000 years ago. Just wrap your mind around that fact for a second. For 5,000 years, they lay seemingly dead and without life. However, someone, one of those archaeologists or someone on the crew, decided to plant a few of them, and wouldn't you know it, they actually grew. Seeds that had laid dormant for five millennia came to life and produced new life. But if they are not planted, if they had not been planted, well, seeds left in that state aren't good for very much. And so what I hope to teach my children is that the more that they hold on to what they have, the more they will miss. Unless we are willing to hold on to what we have with an open hand, we will not find the life that comes after letting go. Or in the words of Jesus, Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, a single seed. But there are countless ways for us to die, and thousands of things we might have to let go of and lose to find life. When a woman gives her time and resources to show love and bring life to the poor, she dies a kind of death. She dies in small ways to herself. She loses something, some small parts of her life synergy. But many are drawn to the love she gives, and what she receives in the joy that loving gives is more than repayment, if repayment was ever the point from the onset. What she had gained was far more than what had to die, but she had to die in part first. When a man gives of his time and resources to provide constant and sustainable water for a people who would otherwise die of thirst or disease, he dies a kind of death. He 
dies in small ways to himself. The sacrifices that he makes, he loses something, some small parts of his life's energy. But many are drawn to the life he gives and what he receives in the joy of loving gives more than repayment if repayment was ever even the point. But before life, he had to die in part first. He had to give perhaps money, perhaps his own energies. He had to let go. I'm learning that when my children decide that their Christmas presents would bring more joy to other children whose parents cannot afford even the cheapest of toys, they die a kind of death. Spent tears, emotional pain, and hours lost trying to convince them that they can let go of those plastic toys for the love of another. Then there are those spent tears and emotional pains and hours lost for a friend or loved one who is enslaved to the addiction that they are enslaved to and that's its own kind of death. There are thousands of different ways for each of us to die to ourselves, to our greedy self-seeking selves. There are a thousand different ways to give of ourselves in hopes to bring new life into the world. And when all else is considered, there are countless ways to die. We could go on and on and on and name the many things that we should, could let go of. Could it be for this reason that you have come to this hour? Jesus said in the moments after telling this parable of seeds and fruit, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Verse 32. Jesus saw on the other side of his own death the promise of new life in that moment. Just as a seed's death is transformed into new life, Jesus' own death is turned on its head by the resurrective power of God. This power that is alive and reckless in the world even today. He would be lifted up and the story of his death and resurrection would truly draw all people to him. And giving of himself, he did not lose himself. Instead, the transformative, life-giving power of God was made plain by the bright light of Easter morning. In a similar way, planted seeds grow. Flowers draw bees and people alike Great shade trees draw those who are tired and in need of rest. Wherever death breaks forth to new life, people notice and are drawn to the life and are changed by it. When we die to ourselves, all manner of people are drawn to the love of God they see in the sacrifice. We find that the dying is not an end, but a beginning of new things. On the other side of each rejection of the selfish, self-advancing ways of this world is a newness of life God calls into being. The poor find a second lease on life. The thirsty who are replenished are given opportunities to, in turn, give their own lives and die their own sorts of deaths in the name of God's love. The addict is restored to wholeness of life the wholeness that he was meant for from the onset and can then help others along the way. But letting go of the seeds or anything else, well, that is hard. It takes quite a bit of faith and trust, in fact. But if we hold on to the seed, it remains dead. But the point of the seed is that it is in the moment when it appears most dead, that it can truly be said to begin to come alive. In the same way, it is precisely when we've yielded our own lives to the transformative power of God that we can truly begin to live. Jesus has called you to die to yourself so that you and others might live. So the question remains, have you died? Have you let go in the ways that you should? It's a long conversation to have with yourself, and we here at Northwood Christian Church are trying to do just that. We are holding more than a handful of seeds 
in our hands and make no mistake about it, we have an abundance of resources, not limitless resources, but still more than not a few. And the question remains, will we plant them into the ground? Will we let certain aspects of ourselves together die so that we might live again and again and again? And Jesus himself was troubled at this prospect. He says in the hours building to his own death, his own letting go, now, he said, now my heart is troubled. And that's probably putting it mildly. And it is troubling and scary to let go of what we have in hopes that something might grow again, to let the seeds fall from our hands, whether the seed is money, time, ideas, or some long cherished tradition. God understands the fear and discomfort letting go brings and will see us through it. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. Which is to say to us today, unless we let go of certain ways of being, what we've had in the past will remain just that, in the past, the last seed in a long line of planting and harvesting. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So we here at Northwood have, in these recent years, been having hard but hopeful discussions about what seeds need planted and what plants need pruned. And we will do the right thing so long as we hold what we have with open hands, minds, and hearts. So that when we are called to let them go, we will find the grace, love, and courage, and joy to do just that. And if God is faithful, and God is faithful, that is our conviction. God is faithful. And if that is true, then we will be amazed at what grows. But only if we are able to let some things go. That song reminds us that when we are invited to places like the communion table, we are invited just as we are. You are welcome in this space just as you are. That is the way of God's love and the way of God's grace.
In this sacred meal that we are about to share, Holy Communion is a reminder of that. And we do it every week as Jesus commanded his disciples to do. On that night where he took bread and after he'd given thanks for it, he broke it and he passed it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is being broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And likewise, took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out to his disciples saying, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is being shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you take of the bread or drink of the cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until he returns. We have one more song to share with one another. I ask that this somber moment of reflecting that I hope began during the sermon and carried on was heightened by communion might continue as we hear this last song and then I will see you all after the benediction. Go in the name of Jesus, who sets us free from a past that we cannot change and opens to us a future in which we can be changed. Almighty God, grant us the grace to grow more and more in your likeness and in your image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>